If you do like to follow along, uh, I will be following fairly closely to the outline that I have there through the door on your left. Uh, they will give the majority of the verses that I'll use, and I'll try not to add too many this morning as I go from memory. Uh, if you saw the title this morning, it's Ignorance, Alienated from the Life of God. Now, you may look at that and you say, ah, sounds like Sean's going to give it to him this morning. And that is the wrong mindset. What I want to do is spend a little bit of time discussing why it is that brethren and non-Christians are ignorant when it comes to the will of God. And I want to talk a little bit about the effects of that. So if you will, go ahead and start turning to Ephesians chapter 4. And we're going to approach this in a very, very logical way as we use the Scriptures to go back and to back up what it is that we say. So if you're there at Ephesians chapter 4, go ahead. I'm going to start down in verse 17. Follow along with me as Paul uh, writes here to the church in Ephesus. <clears throat> he says, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk and the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Paul says very clearly that there are those who have their understanding darkened. He basically goes on and then says these people are alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them. Now, we've seen that take place around us, and we even mentioned some this morning that we've seen that take place in the church. You have things like prejudice and hatred against other people. You have problems like sexual sin. You have problems like vain worship. And what we get from Paul here, or, or his point is, is there's a lot of people that don't have an understanding that what you don't know can hurt you. Now, we get this logically in physical matters. If I go out camping, guys, and I place my tent right next to a bear den, but I don't know what I don't know might hurt me. Now, again, we get that, we get that logically when it comes to physical things, right? But the same is true when we start talking about spiritual matters. When it comes to spiritual matters, the things that you don't know, they may hurt you. Hosea mentions this when he describes the nation of Israel by inspiration. I'm going to go back to Hosea 4, 6, and notice what he says, and it's very close to what Paul states there in Ephesus or Ephesians 4, 17. Hosea 4, 6, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee. That thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. We can go back and look and we get this understanding that people have always been spiritually destroyed due to a lack of knowledge of God's law. And here's the thing, and we get it. One can be as sincere as possible, but without knowledge, they're still sincerely wrong. And we also understand that the result of this, and we, we could look at a number of verses, the result of this even being sincerely wrong is destruction. And this is pointed out again to the Jews after they killed Jesus. I want you to notice what Peter tells them in Acts 3. Again, we find this, this ignorance being called out. It says, And now, brethren, this is Acts 3, 17, And now, brethren, I wot that through ignorance ye did it, as did also your rulers. All right, so Peter just tells these Jews in the crowd that they've rejected the prophesied Messiah, and they killed him. And then he goes on and he says, I know that you did it in ignorance, but here's the thing. Sin is still sin, even when it's done without knowledge or even when it's done uh, sincerely. And so we know that even when it's done in ignorance or even when done sincerely, it still has to be repented of. And I know that because just after he tells them, I know you did this in ignorance, you can skip on down two more verses. Look at verse 19. He says, Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. I wish I could spend a whole lot more time talking about repentance for the non-believer and for the believer. But one of the things I do want to point out is, is every sin done in ignorance or without understanding still requires repentance. And that's what Paul told the believers, the non-believers there at Mars Hill. I'm going to skip down to Acts 17.30. This is a passage probably most of you are familiar with. You may not even need to turn there. You can probably quote it. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. There are a lot of people who are ignorant about the law of God. And ignorance of the law of God alienates man from God. 
We get that logically, and so what I want to do again this morning is I want to begin to look at that logically, and I really want to start with just the most basic understanding of ignorance and being alienated from God, especially for those who might be watching this online. And let's start off with the most basics here. A person has to know the truth if they want to be saved or if they want to stay saved. That's just so logical for anybody who's actually studied the Scriptures. I'll just use uh, John 8, 32. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Guys, we understand logically, and that's why I think why we strive so hard to reach those around us, that if somebody doesn't ever come to the truth, they can never obey the gospel. Right? They're going to remain alienated from God because they, they're ignorant of what is expected of them. But here's the other side of it, and I said it's not going to be one of those where we just we point the finger at, at the non-Christian. You've got people who will obey the gospel, but then they do not obey the teachings of the gospel. What I mean is, is they become a Christian, and they either don't learn enough as they're continuing to grow to, to be faithful, or they were faithful, and we'll address this later, and they go back and they don't live according to that faith that they were even taught of. And notice the results in 2 Thessalonians 1.8. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them. Which one thems are you talking about, Paul? On them that know not God and that obey not the gospel. That word there, euangelion, the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not going to go back and do it, but we could spend a few minutes. Actually, go back to Luke right as he begins the chapter. There, he's going to give the gospel of Christ. He's, that's the entire good news of that book there. The gospel is more than just the death, burial, and resurrection. It is the entirety of of our New Testament. That is the good news, right? And if you don't obey that and you're not faithful, there's no way that you're going to go to heaven. Again, this morning I just had the verse pop into my mind there. John 12, 48 was mentioned in Bible study. We are going to be judged by the Word. So you've got to know it. Now again, let me say this, and, and as I say it, I'll, I'll make the, uh, I'll just admit the fact that this is not very popular. People want to stray away from this. They don't really want to say it, but I mean, you've got numerous denominational and community churches out there, uh, and they're teaching man-made doctrines like faith only, like grace only, whatever their doctrine is. They're not teaching correctly on every subject. And here's what happens. Many of these people, they're simply just ignorant. I'm not saying that they're not sincere. I'm not even saying that they're not spiritually minded. But they're ignorant on what it is when we talk about the very straightforward, unchanged, simple gospel. Guys, remember the, the, the New Testament is written in about sixth grade language. Now, some of the words are antiquated. You're going to need a dictionary when you read it, and I'm going to talk about that here in a little bit. But when people go to these places, and they're not either being taught all of the Scriptures or they're being taught incorrectly from the Scriptures, they simply are ignorant. They're alienated from God, and so people don't get mad, I'll, I'll turn it around. When I was living as a Catholic, I wasn't living as a Christian, I lived as a Catholic. And the Bible doesn't talk about Catholics going to heaven, the Bible talks about Christians, faithful Christians going to heaven. I was ignorant, guys, I'd been taught wrong. I'm going to talk about that too. And I don't think it was because anybody intentionally taught me wrong. I think I was taught wrong by people who were somewhat sincere or pretty sincere, but they didn't know. And so knowing this, Jesus declares that the gospel has got to be taught and it has to be learned. And there's an intent behind that. Notice Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Again, notice this, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even until the end of the world. Amen. Go out, teach people, immerse them, continue to teach them. And the idea is, is this is to be a reciprocal effect. That's how Christian, Christianity is exponentially grown. We go out and we teach, and they teach. We continue to carry on this process. That's our goal as Christians, teach other people about Christianity, get them to become Christians, to be added to the church so that they can go out and continue to teach others. And the process goes over and over and over again. Listen to 2 Timothy 2.2. Paul tells Timothy, And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. That's the goal. 
And so this morning, I do I want to spend a little bit of time focusing on uh, some different kinds of ignorance, some of the causes of ignorance, and then we'll briefly touch on the effects of ignorance. So first, let's, let's tar, start talking about some of these popular types of ignorance. And again, this is going to apply to both the Christian and the non-Christian. You'll find it taking place uh, for both those outside the church and those inside the church. You've got some people who are just ignorant of biblical content or commonly understood principles. Okay? Here's what I mean. People simply have no idea what the Bible teaches because they just never read it. I would say that's one of the largest things. I come into contact in my secular workplace all the time. I'm thinking of a certain individual. We talk about the Bible all the time. But here's the problem. He didn't know anything about the Bible. He's very spiritual. But I'll, I'll, I'll be talking with him and I'll quote a verse and he's like, huh, never heard that before. He doesn't have any idea. He's just simply ignorant of biblical content. He's never really dug in. And you've got a number of people today, and I'm going to use an example for non-Christians, but you've got people who don't understand what the Bible teaches because they've never really read it, and they've heard somebody talk about it, and they just believe them. And I, Here's a good example. You know the majority of people around us do not know that baptism is essential because they just don't know plain, basic Bible teaching. I'm going to read Mark 16, 16. And before I do, for everybody who's watching this online, I'm not asking you to believe anything I say. But if you claim to be a Christian or a follower of God, hopefully you would at least believe what Jesus has to say. In Mark 16, 16, He that believeth and is baptized... Let me pause for a minute. Now, I know for a fact when I'm at work, if my boss tells me to do A and B and I will not get fired, guess what I know I need to do? A and B. The word and is a coordinate conjunction. It joins two words together. The Greek word kai, K-A-I, is the exact same thing. And here Jesus says there are two things that you need to do. Okay, Mark 16, 16. You need to be baptized after you have believed. Right? And if you do that, he goes on, he says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Then he gives the exclusion, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Well, of course you wouldn't go do it if you didn't believe. Now, the common teaching is, as well, if you just believe in Jesus, you're then saved, and then you should get baptized. Guys, that's not what it says, and you're being dishonest if you want to come up with anything else. And let me say this, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but if you go through the Bible, anytime you find the Bible saying something is needing to be done to be saved, I think we know logically you need to do whatever that is. And if you don't want to believe... Mark 16, 16 here, just go over to 1 Peter 3, 21, where it says baptism saves. Can't get any clearer than that. But my point is simply this. There are simply people who are just ignorant of Bible content. They've never read it. They don't have any understanding about many of the principles. And therefore, they are alienated from God. Can't get a whole lot simpler than that. Let me give you another example. You guys, you guys know that you've got people out there that have no idea, and I know it's true because I fell in this situation a number of years ago. I had no idea that there was only one church, and I had no idea that that one body was in unity with all the other uh, congregations regarding doctrine. I'd never heard that. I kind of thought it was a buffet. You could try the Baptist church, or you could try the Christian church, or you could try the Pentecostal if you want some more whoop-whoop. I didn't get any of this. And so I talk with people every day. They don't have any idea that there's any kind of just one body and that they're in unity. Let me give you two verses here, and I'm going to move on as we kind of work through this logically. And I, guys, I'm really praying that somebody will watch this and logically get an understanding of what it is we're talking about. Why are people being alienated from God? Paul says in Ephesians 4, 4, there is one body. Now, if you go back one verse, notice what he says in verse 3 endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now, many people have no idea what he's talking about, and I'm not going to spend a whole sermon on it, but the one body is to keep the unity of the Word given through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And what that means is, is that every faithful congregation in every city would be in unity regarding doctrinal matters with every other faithful congregation. Guys, they can't all be right. They can't, and we get that, again, logically. And when this happens and you have people out just teaching whatever they want to teach, what you have is ignorance, and it alienates people from God. You've got some people who are simply ignorant regarding words. What I mean is, is they, they are ignorant in comprehension. They don't understand the words that they're reading. And let me say this. I mentioned earlier, uh, 
the need for a dictionary. If you guys are reading your Bible, you have to have a dictionary. And I don't care what version you're reading. There are some key versions out there that I like. I like the King James. Guess what? It's antiquated. You need a dictionary, right? Uh, if you're reading the ASV, very literal. I love it. You need a dictionary. Uh, the modern little version, love that version. Probably one of the best, if not the best. Guys, you need a dictionary. Even better is if you've learned to go back in to look at the actual Greek word, and it's not complicated with our software today, and look at the word. But here's the thing. You've got a lot of people today, they don't understand word comprehension, and I'm talking basic, basic things. You look at words like licentious or lascivious, I'm talking about filthy behavior, oftentimes related to uh, sexuality, behavior, uh, thoughts, so forth. How about the word perfect? You have people who read the word perfect and they think it means that you're without sin. I'm going to actually point something out here in a minute. That word actually means complete. Uh, it doesn't mean that you're not sinless. How about the word fornication? You have a lot of people that will go back and look at the word fornication. Again, I'm always careful when I try to address this, but they look at that as just being the, uh, the act of sexual intercourse between the unmarried. But that word, if you know that word, uh, that actually includes any act of the genitalia with two people who are not married. Okay? I'm not going to go into any more detail on that, but a lot of people don't know that. right? They've never looked it up. They're ignorant regarding comprehension, and that's not the only reason. And sometimes it's just because they haven't put the effort in. But there are also words that people have just changed. It seems like they're doing that a whole lot uh, lately. Let me give you an example. You look up the word baptism, it's going to say, I didn't write it down here, but it's going to say, well, it could be sprinkling, could be pouring, could be immersion, right? They've changed the word. <laughs> Baptism is baptizo, the Greek word is to fully immerse. A lot of people don't know that. They've not done their study. How about the word pastor? Once in a while, uh, even my father-in-law still calls me pastor. I've explained to him numerous times I'm not a pastor. I don't meet the qualifications as part of the eldership. People don't know what the word means because they've never looked it up, and society has changed it. But here's simply my point. There are people who are just ignorant of comprehension. And it's really interesting when we in the church try to have a conversation with somebody, and what we say and what we mean is totally different than what they hear because that word is being used in an in a improper or in a way that's not in alignment with the Scriptures. Like, for example, the word pastor or baptize. Right? If I ask someone if they've been baptized, uh, they've been poured on, they might say, yeah, I have. But they, we're using two different definitions. You've got some who are ignorant because they simply don't consider context. I'm going to go back to that word perfect. We will go ahead and turn to Matthew 5.48. You know, you've got some people who have actually come to this conclusion that they need to live a perfect life without sin. And there's some verses used to help promote this, but this is primarily due to uh, ignoring context of a verse. I'm going to go over to Matthew 5.48. Follow along with me. Actually, I looked at this last week just by happenstance. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Now, let me say this for anybody watching this online. There's nobody in this congregation, I hope this isn't a surprise to anybody, that, that is not perfect. There's nobody here that is perfect. I mean, we've all sinned. We've all fallen short. Uh, and so if you're watching this online and that was the mindset you had, well, you've got to be perfect to become a Christian or go to church, no, come to church, and the longer you come to worship here with Christians, the more you'll start to understand, live faithful, and the closer you can come to living that sinless life. But guys, it's never going to happen 100%, and we get that. But why is it then, when Jesus talks about being perfect, that people go, well, he's talking about living a sinless life? Well, I mean, what's the context of what Jesus is actually saying? We just read Matthew 5, 48. Now, as we know here, context is usually best by reading the chapter before and after. So if you want the answer of what it is Jesus is talking about, let's read the previous verses. I'm going to read from verses uh, 43 to 47, Matthew chapter 5. Let's get an understanding of what Jesus is talking about when he says being perfect. That word there, complete. Follow along. Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and, the, and on the unjust. For ye, if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? And if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others?' 
Do not even the publicans so? Jesus says we're supposed to be perfect like our Father in heaven. But the context here is in loving our enemy and doing good to others. He's not talking here about, about being sinless. That's not at all what he's talking about. And I know that because I can go to other verses like 1 John 1.10, which say this. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Now, a lot of people who do not look at context, therefore they don't have an understanding. And therefore, because of whatever it is they've been taught or whatever it is that they believe, they are alienated from God. Now let's look at another example where context really is key in understanding what's being said. And I'm sure all of you here, uh, which are, as I look around, are very well versed, have heard this actually misused. 1 Corinthians 1.17 For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Now I've heard people use this verse to refute the idea of baptism. Guys, let me, before I go any further, let me say this. Paul immersed people. He, he baptized people. We actually know that, and he even talks about it right here. So why does he make the statement that Christ sent him not to baptize? Well, we need to go back and again look at the preceding verses because Paul is talking about a problem here in Corinth. And again, the key is getting it in context. Go back to 1 Corinthians 1. Let's read 11 through 16, which lead up to this statement. 1 Corinthians 1, starting in verse 11. Paul says, For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I have Apollos, and I have Cephas, and I have Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were ye baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you, but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in mine own name. And I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. Paul never said baptism wasn't necessary. He's simply pointing out that his primary role was not to baptize. Let me explain it this way. When I walk out on the, on the, the plant floor, we run machines oftentimes in, um, in automatic where an operator will be running multiple machines. Uh, and sometimes I'll come by and a machine is, is it's starting to back up. And I will go over and I'll clean the parts off of that workstation. If somebody came over, I could actually say, hey, my boss sent me not to run machines. Do, am I saying that I, I don't need to run machines or help them out? I'm not saying that at all. That's not my primary role, but I still do it all the time. And that's what Paul is saying here. In context, you've got some of these Corinthians, they're glorying in the name of the people who baptized them, right? I'm of Paul. I'm of Cephas. I'm of Apollos. And Paul here is calling them out and rebuking them for their division, much of which is based on who it was that baptized, or at least some of it. Many simply are ignorant of application. Now, this is, again, both Christians and non-Christians. I think we get this. Uh, and it's interesting, I, I have talked to people who are well-versed in the Bible. What I mean is, is they knew a lot of Scripture. Guys, memorizing the Bible is not all that helpful if I can't really apply any of it. Right? I can know what a Bible, what a Bible verse states, but if I can't apply it, uh, then it's really not of any effect. I would say that the majority, probably all people, for the most part, who claim to be Christians would say, uh, I am opposed to the idea of false teaching. Here's the thing, though. Most people have no idea what false teaching actually is. But they could find some verses that say false teachers are bad, so they'd say, yeah, I'm totally opposed to false teaching, not having any idea that there's a lot of them out there. You've got people today who will claim to be Christians or followers of God. They'll endorse purity, chastity, modesty, but then they're divided on what is pure or chaste or modest. I'm going to go over to 1 Timothy 4.12 as I point something out. Hopefully uh, saying these things don't get us, uh, get us banned, but eventually it'll probably happen. 1 Timothy 4.12, notice what Paul tells Timothy. And I'm using this verse simply to show that Christians need to be pure. Let no man despise thy youth. Be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. There's no doubt in my mind, based off Scripture, that the Bible tells us we ought to be pure. And here's the problem. Probably every group out there who claims to be Christians, part of Christendom, they say, well, yeah, the Bible teaches that we need to be pure. But they don't get it 
and they can't apply it to their everyday life. Let me give you an example, and, and I don't think anybody can get mad about this because it's been in the news nonstop. You guys know that you've got the Methodist Church, which is about to split over the fact that some of them think homosexuality is okay, and some of them think sexual, homosexuality is sinful. All of them would agree when you go to the verse here, you need to live pure. Some of the Methodists think that homosexuality is fine. Some don't think it is, right? You've got those that claim to be Christians. They say, well, I, I think fornication is wrong. We've got others that say, well, I really don't think it's that bad if you love the person that you're, that you're doing it with. You know, that's the main thing, it's just to, to love one another. And my point is simply this. You've got a ton of people out there who are aware of the commands, uh, but they simply can't apply the commands to correct morality or doctrine, right? I can't even imagine that congregations are arguing over whether certain things are acceptable or not acceptable. Can't even, can't even comprehend it in my mind. I don't even know how you have those conversations when it's so blatantly obvious. But there are people who just, they don't get it. Now let's talk about some of the principal causes of ignorance. You guys are going to have a short sermon today. Principal causes of ignorance. This is really sad, guys, but it's true, and I know that there are a number of people in here who fell into this category. You have some people who have just been given poor information. They've just they've been given bad information, and they never went back, and they never verified it. And so because of that, they're alienated from God. Could be due to family tradition, right? That's what my dad was taught, and if it was good enough for my dad, it's probably good enough for me. Or, heaven forbid, if I say, wait a minute, he's wrong. If I say that, then I'm admitting he went to hell. I can't say that about a family member, right? So some people have just been given poor information. I'm going to give you a Bible example. Go to John chapter 4. You're probably all familiar here. You have a conversation here with Jesus and the Samaritan woman. They're there at the well. And notice what she says. She says to Jesus, Our fathers worshipped in this mountain. Well, that's true. They did. She says, And ye say... That in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Now, Jesus had not said any of that stuff. But the Jews taught that. And the Jews taught that because it was correct. That's what the Old Testament taught. So basically, she paraphrases. My, my family and all of our, our brethren here, right, our fathers, they've all worshipped in this mountain. But you guys say it's in Jerusalem. Well, it actually was. And the point was that she'd been taught wrong. She was following after the generations before her and the teachings of the generations before her, and they were not worshiping correctly. Guys, we have that happening all the time. Uh, when I ask people oftentimes, hey, are you a Christian? Guess what the response is I normally get? Yeah, I'm a Baptist. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a Protestant. Yeah, I'm, I'm Seventh-day Adventist. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm Mormon. Yeah, I'm Jehovah's Witness. Uh, the other day I had an auditor. Yeah, my uh, auditor that I had. Yeah, I'm Catholic. What I asked was, are you a Christian? Those things all got started by men. Those are the teachings of men that have turned into denominational groups. You guys know what a denomination is, right? When you go to the bank and they, you say, here's $100, can you give me back change? And they say, what denominations do you want? A denomination is a smaller part of a whole. When, the, when uh, people began to protest against the Catholic Church, they broke down into groups, Right? But when all of that was going on, let me do it this way. When you had the Catholic Church and everyone that was protesting against them, breaking down into groups, guess what you still had? The Church of Christ. It's always existed. It was separate. It has nothing to do with it. We are not, people will ask me, are you non-denominational? And I get what they're saying. We are pre, pre-denominational. We existed before any of that nonsense ever happened. But many people don't know that because they've been given poor information and they've never verified it. Now, sometimes this comes about by simply uh, poor, careless learning or preconceived ideas. Let me, know, let me show you guys a passage. Go to uh, John 21. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you how sometimes this actually takes place. Here was something that was said. People came to a preconceived idea in their mind, and then they began to go out and teach a preconceived idea because they heard what they wanted, right? John 21, starting in verse 20. Then Peter, turning about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved following, which also leaned on his breast at supper, and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? Peter, seeing him, saith to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? And Jesus saith unto him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. Then went this saying abroad among the brethren, that that disciple should not die. 
Yet Jesus said not unto him, He shall not die. But if I, will, if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Here's my point. Some people heard what they wanted to hear, and they're walking around going, Guess what? John, the, the apostle, he's not going to die. Jesus said he's not going to die. Jesus didn't say that. You guys ever talk to somebody and they hear what they want to hear, but it's not actually what you said? And guys, a lot of times people will take the Bible and they'll read, and they read what they want to read, but it's not actually what the Bible says. So sometimes people have simply been taught wrong. Sometimes people have preconceived ideas or they're just careless in their learning. And we can go back and look at a number of examples which talk about the fact that we need to show care in our learning. I'll just use uh, Acts 17.11. It says, These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, and that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and they searched the Scriptures daily whether those things were so. They were verifying their beliefs or what they were being taught and seeing if it's in alignment with the Scriptures, right? When somebody comes over and says, Yeah, I'm saved by faith only, I say, Why don't we go over to the book of James where it talks about not being saved by faith only, right? We need to get people and ourselves need to make sure we're going back and verifying everything we're being taught or everything that we believe. Now, I mentioned this earlier, but I'll touch back on it again. You've got some who learn the basics, yet they remain ignorant because they simply don't have a desire to increase their learning. How many of you here, please don't holler out, but how many of you here in your mind think you knew everything you needed to know the day you obeyed the gospel? I didn't. I didn't know near enough. I can tell you that. I, was, I, I just didn't know. But I needed to know, and I needed to increase my knowledge after I became a Christian. Listen to 1 Peter 2.2, 2, this mindset here. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. We need to grow. And yet you've got some people who really just don't have that desire. Some people, they, just, they remain indifferent due to... Um, or ignorant because they're indifferent. They just, they just don't care. Listen to John 9, 34. Or actually, let me, Matthew 5, 6, and then we'll go down to John 9, 34. Matthew 5, 6. Notice what Jesus says. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. You have those who have that hunger and that thirst. They desire to learn as much as they can about God's Word. They're constantly studying, and they're, and they're praying, and they're thinking about application in their lives. But you've got other people who, they just don't get it. I mean, I know a lot of people that read their Bible, but they're not really studying. They just read their Bible. They don't really hunger and thirst. Some, they just remain ignorant due to pride. Now, I'm going to give you a Bible example here, but I'll say this, at least in my personal life, and, and I know in dealing with my family, you know, when I decided to leave the Catholic faith, um, there was a lot of anger and resentment because our family has been Catholic at least back to the 1400s. A lot, of, a lot of anger because uh, that really hurt pride. You're, you're leaving the tradition of the family. Let me give you an example here of pride taking place. This is actually one of my favorite accounts. If you're not familiar with this account and you're watching this online, go back and, and read the entire account. But you've got this blind man who's been healed, and they pull him in front of him, and he's explaining all of this to them. They've even, they've even uh, talked to his parents. They pull him back in, and verse... Uh, John chapter 9, verse 34, They answered and said unto him, Thou wast altogether born in sins, and dost thou teach us? And they cast him out. Well, this is after they kept saying, Tell us again. And he's like, What? Do you want to be his disciples too? You got a blind man here. He couldn't see. They brought people in who confirmed he'd never seen at all his entire life. Right? And they accuse him of being in sin. And he shows up, and he now by by a miracle, miraculously, from Jesus, is able to see. These people that call him in out of a sense of pride, after they've even confirmed he's been blind his whole life, they look right past the fact that he has been miraculously healed by Jesus Christ, and due to their pride, even though they see it and they see the evidence of it, they reject the Messiah. That's my point. Oftentimes, people, just due to their pride, they won't accept what is right in front of them. Many times they won't even accept what is right in front of them in the Bible, right? They'll see it, and they'll say, but, and they'll come up with an excuse. Let me give you another reason here. You've got many people who know the truth. They really just have poor execution in carrying it out. You may say, well, what exactly do you mean? I'm talking about Christians. 
What I mean is, is they're just not faithful. You've got people who are Christians who are, are not faithful. Listen to John 8, 31 and 32. Again, it's a passage you're all familiar with. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on Him, If ye continue in My word, then are ye My disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. How many Christians will show their ignorance simply through the fact that we know, they know what God's will is regarding a matter, yet they will not do it. And how about this? A good example? Anybody know somebody who forsakes the assembling? Hebrews eleven twenty five. There's no Christian I know who can go, oh yeah, it's perfectly fine to skip all the assemblings. I don't know anybody that thinks that's okay. I know a lot of people that do it. They know better than that. But it happens, and it's a good example of it. Now let's talk very quickly, and I'm almost done. The effects of ignorance. Well, we started off with that in Ephesians 4, verses 17 through 18. Ignorance results in alienation from God, both for the one who is not a believer or never becomes a believer, or the one who is a believer, however, he's still ignorant in carrying out the Scriptures. Now, Paul shows this, and I'm going to use the example of the Jews being alienated from God. Go over to Romans chapter 10, verses 1 through 3. And of course, we, uh, we do not subscribe to the idea of Anglo-Israelism. If you've never heard of that word, let me tell you what it is, because you'll know somebody who believes it. Anglo-Israelism is the idea that Israel is God's people. They'll always be God's people and they are saved. And, and therefore, you know, um, we need to help watch out for Israel. That's held by a number of uh, former presidents and virtually everyone who's premillennial holds to that idea. And here's what we learn in Romans chapter 10. Guess what? The Jews, yeah, they were alienated from God at the time of this writing. Romans 10, 1 through 3. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Guys, and I'm going to go on here in a minute, but the Jews are no longer God's people. They once were, but Christians are God's people. We could look and spend a lot of time in the book of Romans, but there were two, both Gentile and Jew, which became one in the church. He goes on, For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Let me pause again. You guys know anybody like that spiritually? I talk to people like that all the time. For they being ignorant, there's that word again, of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness. <laughs> this sounds like the religious world around us. Have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Here's his point. The Jews are lost. The Old Testament law at this time had been nailed to the cross. Colossians 2.14. Nobody could live as a faithful Jew at this time and go to heaven because the Old law had been nailed to the cross. They're living under the law of Christ. Now, with that being said, and Paul saying this, we go back and we look and acknowledge the fact that Saul is an example how the ignorant can attempt to hurt God's people, and unknowingly they'll even do it to themselves in the process. Listen to 1 Timothy 1.13, because Paul was zealous for his faith, but not for the Christian faith. And that was what was in place at the time. 1 Timothy 1.13, he describes himself, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it, notice this, ignorant in unbelief. That describes most religious people today. And because of this ignorance, but because of his zealousness, he literally persecuted and injured the church. How many of you guys have seen people attacking the church of Christ for our beliefs? Not having any idea that they're attacking God's people, but they're doing it sincerely Guys, they fall right in line with, with Saul. Listen to Acts 8, 1 through 4. And Saul was consenting unto his death, and at that time there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. And therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Did the Christians shut up out of fear? No, they ran, but they continued preaching and teaching the word everywhere they went. Paul was a very devout person. He was doing what he thought was right, but in his ignorance he rebelled against God. He rebelled and actually hurt God's people. And guys, the same thing is happening today, both by those who are Christians and non-Christians. Let me sum this up and I'm done. As Christians, we need to continuously 
improve our knowledge. We need to have an understanding of the faith. We need to live by that faith. As mentioned again earlier, John 12, 48, we'll be judged by that faith. But if we don't, we're going to find ourselves alienated from God. Let me give you one last passage, James 1, 21 through 25. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. Guys, that doesn't sound good, right? He's saying, don't be involved in that. And receive with meekness the engrafted word. Why? Which is able to save your souls. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. He's talking about a mirror here, guys. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, that is the New Testament, that is the law of Christ, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. If a man does that, he's not going to be alienated from God. And that should be our goal as Christians. Now, as I draw this to a close, certainly our goal is to be a faithful Christian. If you're here and you've not been faithful, if there are areas you have fallen short, repent of it and turn back to God and again strive to be faithful. But if you're here or you're watching this online, are you a Christian? I'm not going to go back and quote all the verses, but I do want you, if you're watching this or if you're here, uh, write these down. What you need to know is that you need to have a belief that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He is the Messiah. Right? If you don't believe that, you're going to die in your sins, John 8, 24. So you're going to have this faith which cometh by hearing, Romans 10, 17. People were out in the first century, they were teaching that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. And when people heard it, many of them believed. But they weren't saved by faith only or belief only. Jesus talked a lot about the need for repentance, Luke 13, 3 and 5. Paul talked about it at Mars Hill, Acts 17, 30. And the reason people need to repent is because all men have sinned everywhere and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3, 23, and the consequence is death. And so you need to repent of that. You need to confess Christ with your mouth, Romans 10, 9 and 10, just as we see from the uh, eunuch there in Acts chapter 8. Uh, and you need to be immersed in water for the remission of sins, Mark 16, 16, also Acts 2, 38. You are saved through the act of baptism, 1 Peter 3, 21. It's just one of the many things you need to do. It's no more important than any other act that you need to do. It is how you get into Christ, Galatians 3, 26 and 27. It is a burial in water, Romans 6, 3 and 4, in which you come up a new creation. As that new creation, when you live faithful, you will not be alienated from God. But if you have never done what I just told you, you have not been added to the church, Acts 2, verse 47, and you are without a doubt alienated from God. If you're here and there's a way we can help you in any way, whether it's to uh, help you to obey the gospel today or whether it's to offer prayers on your behalf, you can come forward as we're led in a song of invitation.